Last week, we spoke about the importance of self-esteem, of having a realistic self-image. And if you remember, I pointed out that there are a lot of people, a lot of excellent people, gifted, well-qualified, who for some reason or other grew up feeling negatively about themselves and unjustifiably so. And we pointed out that as a result of the fact that they felt negative about themselves, many things happened in their lives, including alcohol or uh, drug problems. I want to continue a little bit on that theme today. Uh, just a little bit of elaboration. Uh, first of all, I pointed out, uh, if you remember, that a lot of alcoholics will say, I'm a loner. Uh, and almost as though they don't like being with people. Remember what we pointed out, that it wasn't that they don't like being with people at all. It's that they're afraid of rejection because given the way they feel about themselves, they anticipate that they are going to be rejected. The reason for that is this. If I were to ask any of you, what do you see over here? You would say uh, a lectern. I say, what color? You say brown. So, all right, now, what do you think somebody else sees when they look at this? And you'll say, well, of course, they see a brown lectern. What else? Because normally we assume that the way we see things, that's the way they are. And when other people look at them, that's the way what they, that's what they see as well. I mean, why would anybody see anything different? That's reality. Now, given that, if you have a perception of yourself and you think of yourself and you see yourself as being unlikable or inadequate in one way or another, what do you think normally? Everybody else who looks at me is going to see the same thing that I do. So if you see yourself in a negative light, your immediate conclusion is that's the way everybody else sees you. And that, that's why we expect that we're going to be rejected. We're going to be unlike because we see ourselves in a negative sense and we assume that everybody else is going to see that. So that's the reason behind the withdrawal. Now, some people do not have that much difficulty in terms of socializing because they think, well, you know, you can fool some of the people all of the time or all of the people some of the time. And, oh, if during social relations, I can put on an act. Uh, I know really that I am really negative, but I can fool people and put on a front. But where they become uh, frightened is that if they have to go into an, any kind of intimate relationship, a close relationship, well, heavens, I can't put on an act all the time if I'm going to be living with this person in, in close contact seven days a week, 24 hours a day under the same roof. I mean, it's only going to matter, be a matter of time before he or she sees through me and sees through the facade. So that even though they may have social relationships that are comfortable, they become terribly uncomfortable when it comes to intimate relationships. Now think, if you will, to how many people you know who had no difficulty during their courtship and right after the marriage thing began to fall apart. And the reason for that is, during the courtship, dating a few times a week, fine, I can put on an act. But if you expect me to put on an act all the time, that is so uncomfortable, I can't make it stick, and the relationship breaks up once the knot has been tied. We also pointed out the fact that in addition to withdrawing from a relationship, some people will actually precipitate a rejection. And I'd just like to carry that a little bit further and tell you of a case that I had a number of years ago with a young man of 21 years old. He was a beautiful guy. He had a straight four-point average in school, handsome fellow, likable guy, sweet person. But that is not what he thought of himself. He thought of himself as being some sort of uh, inadequate person, unlikable, unattractive, whatever. He had uh, met a young woman, a student nurse, very lovely young woman. He fell in love with her. And he dated her, but every time he called her up to ask for a date, he'd go through an anxiety, a panic attack, because this is the time that she's going to say no. I mean, he, why would she want somebody like him when she could have the best? Someone as lovely as she wouldn't take anyone as him. She's probably only doing it because of charity. Right? Or, you know, maybe he's going to call her up and she's going to say, okay, fella, now look, I dated you, yeah, but that was last month, it was Be Kind to Animals Month, and this is some other kind of month, and I'm not going to do that anymore, you know? So he'd go through he, uh, a fright. Of course, every time he called her for a date, she accepted because she loved him. But he could not accept that about himself. And the suspense became so tremendously unbearable that one day he sent a telegram to her father saying, congratulations, in seven months you'll be a grandfather, and he signed his name to it. And of course, uh, the young lady called him up and told him drop dead and never want to see you again. Now, he was standing in his, in his hospital room, beating his head against the wall. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? I loved her so, why did I force her to reject me? And it was obvious why he did. 
it was easier to get it over with rather than to deal with the daily suspense of when's it going to happen. And if we look over our lives, we'll see that some of us have done either, some of us have done both things. Some of us have withdrawn socially, certainly many of us have withdrawn from intimacy, and some of us has pre have precipitated the very rejection that we feared would happen. Another thing that happens when you feel inadequate about yourself. You see, if I think I'm a pretty good person, I know that there are successes in life. I'll have my successes, I'll have my failures. I hope I'll have more successes than failures, and that's pretty true for all of us. Nobody likes a failure. I don't want to fail. But if I do fail, it's not going to kill me. It's not going to destroy me. I can afford a failure, as unpleasant as it is. But that's because I feel okay about myself. But what happens if you don't feel okay about yourself? What happens if you feel so inadequate about yourself that you can't take the chance of failure? Failure is devastating. Well, you gotta make sure you don't fail. How do you do that? Well, there's one of two ways. One, don't do anything. Don't try, you can't fail. When you get up in the morning, pull the sheet over your head and don't get out of bed. And then if you don't get out of bed, you can't do anything wrong. That's one way. And a lot of people do that. There's some people who found another way. Be perfect. Don't give yourself the opportunity to fail. Perfectionism. Now, the problem with perfection is that only God can be perfect. No human being can ever achieve that. And if we try to be perfect, we're going to fail because of our perfectionistic efforts. Example. There's a young woman, a nurse, at a hospital that I worked for. Now, you know that nurses are very cautious not to make medication errors. And yet, they're only humans, and sooner or later, in the career of a nurse, she's going to give the patient the wrong medication. Usually, it's nothing serious. But she was devastated by the thought that she might medic make an error in medication. Now, normally what happens when a uh, doctor writes an order, writes the order on the chart, the nurse takes off the order from the chart, records it on a little card, and that card is used as the medication card from which all the other nurses use to give medication. Well, she would pick up the card and look at it, and the first thought she had was, I wonder whether that's the order that the doctor really wrote. So she'd have to go back and take Dr. X's chart out and look at the, oh yes, this is the order that he wrote, and then she'd go back, oh no, wait, Dr. X has three different patients on the unit. Did I look at the right patient? I better go check. Maybe this wasn't the one. So she'd go back and check it again. Yes, this was the right one. She'd come back and look at the card. She'd go to the shelf, take out the medication, put it in the little medication cup. Did I take it out from the right bottle? Right. Now, there are two bottles of there. One was 500 milligrams and the other was 250 milligrams. Now, did I take it out from the right bottle? So she'd have to go back and check it, come back and... And then this went on several times. Now, with 25 patients on the unit, sooner or later, she found that uh, medications that were supposed to be given at 7 o'clock were given at 8 because it took her that much time to check out each medication. Well, the supervisor called her in and she said, you know, we can't have this and uh, do you need any help with uh, getting your medications out? Well, when she was criticized, to her that was a put-down. And when she was made to feel worse about herself, what did she do? She became more perfectionistic. And her checking just became worse. And then it got to the point where she told the patient, gave him the medication, and she said, oh, don't, don't take it. Then she took the medication back, went through, and made her, her recheck again. Pretty soon, 7 o'clock medications were being given at quarter to 9. And things continued to get worse to the point where she one time told the patient who had taken the pill into his mouth, don't swallow it. Right? Made the patient take the medication out of his mouth, recheck it again. Of course, she was fired. So what happened? She failed. Why? Because she tried to be perfect. Now, someplace we have to recognize we have to do things appropriately and we have to check out. I mean, when I get onto an airplane, right, I don't want the pilot to take for granted that everything is right. You know, I want him to get in the airplane, there's a bunch of dials up there, and I want him to check all the dials and make sure that things are in proper order to defer flying the plane. But I do want to get where I'm going, and if he's going to sit there for 11 hours checking those dials, I'll never get where I'm going. Right? So, you do have to have a reasonable amount of perfectionism, but not to the point that's self-defeating. People who feel inadequate about themselves, remember, we're talking about people who feel unjustifiably inadequate, right? These people will check out things for a thousand years before ever getting anything done, and of course never get anything done and precipitate their failure. One of the other things that happens by people who feel inadequate is instead of feeling, recognizing their feelings or being aware of their feelings, their system turns it around and makes them deny. We ever heard of denial before, right? This is a different kind of denial. They deny their feelings of inadequacy by insisting that they're perfect. I am all perfect. I can do nothing wrong. You ever meet those kind of people? They can do nothing wrong. They are always right. Uh, in Charlie Brown's cartoons, you have the little character Lucy. 
right? Well, Lucy can never do anything wrong. And anything that ever happened that goes wrong, she's always got an excuse for it because Lucy is always right. Now, there are a lot of people around who are always right. There are some people who have this condition that is referred to as narcissism. They expect everybody to worship them. I know that there are some men, for example, that expect absolute worship from their families, right? When they come home, their wife is supposed to greet them, the children are supposed to stand up and salute, everybody is supposed to recognize their superiority. And if you ever try and criticize them or cross them up, they become furious. Now, they are referred to as narcissistic, which is a mistaken term, because the term narcissism comes from a Greek myth about Narcissus, who is a person who fell in love with his own image in the water. And uh, his, he saw his reflection and fell in love with himself. So these people are thought of as, our, as people who are in love with themselves. Nothing could be further from the truth. These are not people who love themselves. These are people who hate themselves with a passion. In fact, they hate themselves so deeply that they can't stand themselves. And in order to defend themselves against these feelings of self-hate, right, they build up an attitude of, I'm the greatest. And so narcissism is really not self-love at all. Narcissism is the negative self-image with an enormous amount of self-hate. And uh, some people have this in uh, intense degrees. Let me give you an example of what can happen. And this was a, of an actual case of a young man who was in the construction business and was doing very well. And his, uh, he had four children. They had a very fine marriage. When the youngest child reached the age of where he could go to school all day, the wife found that she had a great deal of time on her hands. And she was a very efficient housewife, and everything at home was taken care of. And she decided that she wanted to do something with her skills, so she took some courses and uh, received her license as a uh, real estate agent. And her husband supported her in this. He thought it would be wonderful. He's in construction business. She's in realty. They'll be able to work together. And then as soon as she began working and she made a few sales and earned some money, a dramatic change happened. Why aren't you home with the children when you're supposed to be? Where are you running around all hours of the night? And he told her he would help her on some deals. Every deal he helped her on, he sabotaged. And he began to, to become a, uh, a maniac, right? uh, would throw fits of temper. And she came saying, look, I don't want to break up the marriage, but I, I, can't, I can't live with this kind of insanity. And he agreed to come and talk to me. And after talking to him just a short period of time, it was so obvious what was happening. He was a lovely person, a really sweet person. The wife loved him dearly, the children loved him. However, his problem was he did not believe that he was lovable. Why would she stay for all of her life with a guy like me? It just didn't make sense to him, except for the fact, well, she's financially dependent upon me. Of course she'll stay with me. Where is she going to go? You know, I'm earning a fine living. What happened was then that as soon as he became aware that she was able to earn money on her own, and he became aware that she may become financially independent, that he began to see, uh-oh, now she's going to leave me. And so he reacted so violently against her uh, uh, new career because he felt that this is going to mean that she's going to leave him because he doesn't have anything else to offer her except financial security. Now what happened was this was not at all true. She loved him for who he was, not for what he was earning. However, because of the way he felt about himself and the way he reacted, he almost succeeded in breaking up the marriage. Fortunately, we were able to get the situation cleared up and he was able to get some help with developing a positive self-image and seeing that uh, his idea that she uh, did not love him except for his uh, earning capacity was a figment of his imagination. There's another thing I want to point out to you about the self-image. You know that some people, maybe a lot of people, use various kinds of chemicals, like alcohol or downs, in order to relax, right? Now, why should people have difficulty in relaxing? Now, a lot of people think that they can relax. What they can do is they can divert themselves, they can amuse themselves, but very few people know how to relax. My definition of relaxation is not playing golf. I mean, that's a very fine diversion. Not watching a ball game. That's a very fine diversion. It's amusing. And they're all very fine things to do. But all of these things, reading a book, watching a play, watching TV, playing golf, all of those things are very fine activities. They are not relaxation. They are distractions and amusements and diversions. Pure relaxation is lying back on a sofa, on a hammock, on an easy chair, 
closing your eyes, not being asleep, because asleep is not relaxation. Sleep is sleep. But lying back, doing nothing except breathing and enjoying it for 10 minutes. Now, let me suggest that you try it. Some people can do it. Other people can't. And I have to share with you my own experience, because this is how I became aware way back in late 1960s about the importance of a self-image. See, what happened is I, I've been suffering from a bad back for 25 years or more. And of course, I would not take anything to kill the pain because painkillers are dangerous, right? We all know that. But someone told me go down to hot springs and take the mineral baths because they're very good for muscular pains. And I really needed to get away because I was under such constant pressure of the telephones and this and the other thing. I really needed a period away from everything. So I went to the mineral baths and hot springs. Well, first day I got into the whirlpool bath and oh, did that feel great. It was just a, such a superb feeling. Uh, the warm water circulating around and no pressure, nobody to bother you. Oh, it was the greatest feeling I'd ever experienced. And after about five or six minutes, I said to the attendant in the spa, I said, oh, this was wonderful. And I began to get out of the tub and he said, oh, no, sir, you have to stay there for 20 minutes more. I said, why? He said, because that's how the treatment goes. 25 minutes in the whirlpool and then you go in for the rub down. So I went back in and after five minutes more sitting in the tub, I said, look, I don't care what the treatment consists of. I'm not sitting here any longer. I was going out of my mind. And he said, no, sir, you sit there 15 minutes more. You can't have the treatment. Well, I went back in for 15 minutes more and it was the most difficult 15 minutes of my life. Later on that afternoon, I began thinking back. What happened here? You know, boy, was this a rude awakening. I thought that if only people left me alone and they could, took the pressures off and the telephone wouldn't ring, right, this would be heaven. And here I am sitting in a whirlpool, right, what could be more comfortable, more secure, no pressure, no... And I couldn't take it for more than seven or eight minutes. And as I thought about it, I realized, you see, when you're diverted by television, by a conversation, by a book, by watching a game, you're diverted from everything, including yourself. Here what happened was, they left me alone in a little room, nothing to read, nothing to look at, nothing to listen to, nobody to talk to. Who was my companionship? Me. They left me alone in a little room with myself as company. Well, you know what happens if you're ever left alone in a room with somebody for company who you don't like? It becomes intolerable. And I realized what was happening. I couldn't stand myself. And when you left me alone with myself, I couldn't take it for more than five minutes. I began to think, boy, this is crazy. And then began looking at, what is this about myself that I don't like? And out of that developed my a great deal of my interest in the problems of negative self-image. And I can tell you I've succeeded something, uh, some way, in, uh, because I've been down since then uh, three times or four times to hot springs, and I can stay 25 minutes in a tub bath right, with nobody around, and I can perfectly relax perfectly well. So if you have any question as, do I really like myself or not, do this as a test. Right? Get back in an easy chair, turn off the stereo, turn off the TV, you know, and sit back and see how long you can take it before you have to get up and get out of there or do something. Right? And if you can't exceed seven or eight minutes, it's because you don't like yourself. And then I think that's a good indication that you ought to get to, to do something about the, your self-image. And of course, one of the best ways to do anything about your self-image, work the 12 steps. The program is a fantastic way. So I pointed out in my little book, Self-Discovery and Recovery, that if you use the 12 steps, you can get to discover yourself. Now, this business of discovering oneself is something that we have to realize. Let me just... Uh, mentioned to you. Remember the fourth step? We have to do a fearless inventory. Did you ever wonder what's there that I have to be so courageous about? What's so frightening about a self-examination, about an inventory, that we have to be fearless about it? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. But as an introduction to that, I want to tell you about a case that I had. I think I mentioned this case in the uh, last week's lecture about a young woman who was a very accomplished physician and she thought very poorly of herself and all of the fact, the fact that she had been successful and had won Phi Beta Kappa and all kinds of honors, she didn't see anything positive about herself. She felt totally inadequate. Well, after she began her course in sobriety, she took a job and it was not too demanding of a job. And then after about three months, she called me up and she said, oh, Dr. Twersky, uh, I'm in such a bad way. I said, what's the problem? And she went on to tell me what the problem was. 
And uh, I said, well, have you talked with your sponsor about this? Well, a little bit. I said, well, talk a little bit more with your sponsor and uh, go to a few more meetings. Another three or four months go by and I get another call. Oh, are things ever bad? What's the problem? And so she goes on to tell me what the problem was. And I said, well, what, what happened to that problem that happened four months ago? And she said, oh, that. That was a trifle. That turned out fine. But this time, things are really bad. Well, I suggest that she talk with her sponsor, talk with some friends, uh, do a few more meetings. Four months later, another call. Like every three or four months, the same kind of thing. This time, it's really bad. Oh, last time, that was a trifle. That, that went away. And after this continued for a number of times, I called her in. I said, look, I have to talk with you a little bit. Come to the office. So she came to the office, and I pointed out to her the problem that happens when a person feels inadequate. I mean, we've been feeling inadequate about ourselves since we were four or five or six years old. Where this inadequacy comes from, I'm not sure. But we've had that feeling long before we took the first drink or the first drug. Now, what happens is the negative self-image, the feeling of inadequacy, can be thought of in this fashion. See, here I have a rather rigid cardboard. I'm going to take it over and bend it, okay? Now, I've got it folded. Now I'm going to take and straighten this out. Now no matter how much I straighten it out, that crease is there. I mean, I can press it with a flat iron, that crease will still be there. And the fact that that crease is there makes it so much easier now to bend this. Now if I try to bend this part, there's resistance. Over here, it bends very easily. Why? Because there's once been a crease there. That's what happens with people who have a negative self-image. Even though after a period of years, you get to feel more positive about yourself and you get a much healthier self-image, but that crease is always there, which means that any time a new challenge comes up, it resurrects the whole feeling of negativity again. And all of those feelings that you've buried or succeeded in overcoming are apt to come back. Now, that is what happened with this wonderful young woman. And I pointed this out to her. I said, look, when you called me initially, what had happened at this? You had started off functioning in sobriety and functioning well. Now, you know what happens if you're a failure? Nobody asks you to do anything because you're messing everything up. Nobody makes any demands of you. And you don't make any demands out of yourself either because I can't succeed. But what happened was that you started functioning well. And because you functioned well, somebody made some kind of demand at you. Okay, here you came to a crisis point. As soon as a new demand is made for you, I can't do it. I'm going to fail. It's not going to work out. I'm going to fall flat on my face. Right? And you became depressed. Now what happens when you became depressed was that you could have drunk, and then you would have gone all the way down, but instead you did the right thing, you talked with your sponsor, went to a few more meetings, and you overcame the challenge. Well, when you overcome the challenge, you rise to a new level of functioning. So now you will rose to this level, and now you are functioning at that level. And because you functioned well at that level, sooner or later somebody made a demand of you. Maybe your children, maybe your job, maybe you made a new demand of yourself, but any new demand was, again, a challenge. Right? And as soon as that challenge comes, remember that priest? It resurrects all those feelings of negativity again. I can't do it. I'm going to fail. Well, at that point, you could have drunk, and you would have gone all the way down. Or what you did was you overcame the challenge. So now you overcame the challenge. You're functioning at a new level. And because you function well at a new level, you reach this crisis. You overcome that. You reach this crisis. And so what happens is that as you grow in sobriety, you're constantly being challenged with more and more demands as your function improves. And that's the way it should be. But it's important to realize that once we achieve a better self-image, that's not the solution to the whole thing. We've got to continue to work on our sobriety, continue to work the steps, uh, continue to gain self-esteem, because we're constantly going to be challenged. And at each point of these challenges, you can be sober for 15 years. And when you're challenged again, you have to have, again, a feeling of, I can't do it, I may fail. And that becomes a point of vulnerability and can serve as a, a crisis, serves as a point where you can either fail by drinking or using or overcome it and rise to a new level. And we're constantly growing, endless, endless growth. How long do you have to continue to grow? Only until you die. Right? Our lives should be a constant period of growth. Now let me get back to what I said. Because you function well, Right? New demands are going to be made of you. And that can be frightening. And in that sense, being a failure and being in a rut has a pathological redeeming feature. 
If I don't succeed, nobody can bug me to do anything. We got to be careful about that because this is why some people hang on to that negative self-image because in a kind of sick way, it's comfortable. As long as we feel that we're inadequate and as long as we feel we're failures, we don't have to do anything and don't have to accept any challenges. I had a young woman who came into treatment. She came in her first day in detox. She was 24 years old. She said, could I have psychological tests while I'm here? I said, why do you need psychological tests? She says, I'm afraid I've gotten brain damage from drinking. I said, no, if you don't have brain damage, don't worry about it. Next day I came up on the unit and she says, can I have a brain scan? I said, why do you want a brain scan? She says, I'm afraid I got brain damage. I said, you don't have brain damage. Third day I came up and she wanted an electroencephalogram, a brainwave test. I said, why on earth do you want a brainwave test? She says, I'm afraid I got brain damage from drinking. I said, what's all this preoccupation with brain damage? She said, well, you know, from all my drinking and drugging, I said, but I've told you three times you don't have brain damage, so forget about it. And we sat down and talked a little bit, and you know I became, what I became aware of? She wanted to have brain damage. Why on earth? Because then she could say, get off my back, everybody. I've got brain damage. I'm a failure. I can't succeed. Don't expect me to be sober. Poor me. I'm brain damaged. There is that kind of pathological redeeming factor in hanging on to a negative self-image. You know, and some people talk about fear of success. Success means new responsibilities. Now, the question is, why do we have to have a fearless inventory? And I'll ask people, what's so frightening about doing an inventory? And they say, oh my goodness, if I do an inventory, I'll become aware of all the terrible things I did. I said, no way, you already know those. You don't have to do an inventory for that. You know what the frightening thing about of an inventory is? We'll discover how adequate we are. We'll discover the truth about ourselves. We'll discover that we're wonderful people. We'll discover that we're capable. That's frightening, because if I'm capable, then I say, okay, perform. It's so much easier to be in the rut, to be negative. So don't be surprised that you're going to find some resistance in getting your correct self-image. And the resistance is going to be because as you find out how excellent you really are, and as you find out the truth about yourself, you're going to find that you have to perform and meet up to those expectations. And you can no longer get into the rut and say, poor me, I can't do it, I'm a misfit, I'm incapable, I'm inadequate. So the real reason that the inventory is so frightening is not because we're going to find out how terrible we are. Quite the contrary. We're going to find out how good we really are. So uh, in this program of rehabilitation, you're going to get a good bit of assistance in making a self-discovery. And you're going to find out that contrary to your thinking, you are wonderful people, much better than you ever gave yourself credit for. Uh, It'll be frightening to have that realization because as pleasant as it sounds, it does carry with it new responsibility. Trust me this far, okay? No one who has ever made a self-discovery has ever been disappointed. It may be frightening initially, but it turns out to be the most gratifying experience. You're going to find out the truth about yourself, that you're much more wonderful and capable and lovable people than you ever gave yourself credit for being. So, have a happy self-discovery.